Okay, you should be seeing some uh, old VHS tapes, and, and then you'll see the DVDs here in a little bit. But um, just to show you that I have been a fan of Dr. Hoven and his materials for a very long time, um, I was watching him back before they even had DVDs available. So I uh, just wanted to show that before we get started. That's actually, this is where I keep the books, and then there's another shelf over that way. And of course, there are various books throughout the ministry headquarters here. But uh, that's kind of our DVD VHS area. Of course, we have other ones of those around too, but that's usually where we keep them. And uh, I'll just let my wife finish up getting the camera all set up there. But um, this is going to be a very important study. And uh, this is one that I'm not doing out of anger or malice or spite or hatred or anything else. Uh, absolutely not. And uh, I've been praying about this for a long time. Um, I heard about this and I kind of thought to myself, you know, it really kind of bothered me that I heard that Ken Hoven had gone, you know, to the post-trib position. And uh, so I've been wanting to do this. It's just I've been very busy. So... Um, I'm finally getting around to it, and uh, it's going to be a detailed study. I'm going to go through his entire book, and again, if you didn't see any of my other videos, this I printed it out. I can't stand reading ebooks that gives me a headache. <laughs> okay, I just can't stand it. So uh, that's why I printed the thing, and I went through it and highlighted what needed to be highlighted, and we'll be talking about that in this study. Um, but I've had a lot of people and they say, you know, well, shouldn't you go to him privately? Okay, I'm going to show you the scripture that people go to. I'm going to show you why uh, it doesn't work for this. Matthew chapter 18, verse uh, 15. I'm actually going to show the Bible in this because uh, I realize there will be some people watching this and they might not have access to the Bible or whatever. Uh, Matthew chapter 15 or excuse me, chapter 18, verse 15, says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. It goes down through. But look here. If thy brother shall trespass against thee. Now, uh, Ken Hoven did not trespass against me with this study. Okay? Um, he released this thing out there for the body of Christ to read. Now, I'm a member of the body of Christ, in spite of what some people think, you know, uh, some people that are quite heretical. But uh, I am saved. I am a Bible-believing preacher, King James Bible-believing preacher. And Ken Hoven put this thing out for the entire world to see, and so I'm going to be debunking this. And you say, well, why didn't you go to Ken Hoven first and talk to him in private? Uh, well, if I did, what would he say? Uh, did you read my book? Did you see my opinions? Did you see the scriptures that I presented? Oh, no, I didn't do that yet. Well, you know, Go read the book. So before I even attempt to get in contact with, with Brother Hoven, I thought I'm going to read this book and I'm going to show from the King James Bible and the King James Bible alone, by the way, I'm not going to use any kind of commentaries or any books on the rapture or anything else. I don't need any of those things. I'm going to show from Scripture alone that he's wrong. And um, I'm going to address this uh, not directly to Kent Hoven. Uh, he's very busy. Uh, I don't know if he's going to watch this, if he has the time to watch this, whatever. If you are, uh, I love you in the Lord, Dr. Hoven. Um, it's because of, of you, Dr. Hoven, if you're watching. It's because of you that I actually came to the Lord. I was a false convert for quite a few years, um, going to church and living very, very wickedly. I was not saved. I was a, I had prayed a prayer without really even understanding what I was doing. Uh, there's a lot of that that goes on. And uh, I was not I was not truly saved, so I at one point in time I was a professional artist. Just to give you a short little testimony thing here, I was a professional artist and and in some very wealthy circles of people and exhibiting in a lot of art galleries and things like that. And I just got sick of it, and I said, you know, I I prayed the one night. I was it was about I don't even know what time it was, uh, very 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 early in the morning or late at night, depending on how you want to say it two or three o'clock in the morning probably, and I walked out of my, my uh, shop slash art studio, and I just looked up at the sky, and I said, God, I know you're there, and I really don't understand what life is about. I have no idea. I'm not happy. And I said, 
please give me wisdom. And I didn't know about the verse in James. I had no idea that you're to ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. And uh, one of the very first things that came along was actually the issue about the rapture followed very closely behind that uh, with your creation science materials over there. And uh, I just, it, it opened up a door to a lot of other things and I started to study and I just kind of put my whole business on hold and I went and studied uh, for years and years and years. I studied just about everything I could. I read a lot of books, um, listened to a lot of sermons, uh, preaching and traveled around and things. So the whole point is I'm in ministry today because of Dr. Hoven. Um, but I am going to be addressing just the body of Christ in this video. I'm not going to keep saying now, Dr. Hoven, you're wrong, or, or Brother Hoven, you're wrong. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say now he's wrong. Okay? And um, in terms of, I've had different people say, could you debate Dr. Hoven on this issue? Well, uh, I have taught against the, the thing of debating because, honestly, I've never really seen anything positive come from these debates. Um, you know, I think between two brethren, I think debate between two brethren, uh, it's questionable whether or not you should even do that. Um, I would be willing to discuss it definitely and show from Scripture and Scripture alone. I don't need anything else that uh, the body of Christ will be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. And again, we're going to see in the study that, that uh, Brother Hoven here is very confused about this time period that's coming, uh, extremely confused. And I just want to say another, one of the big issues is, uh, like many people, um, Brother Hoven says, well, you know, I used to be pre-trib and now I'm not. And what happens is a lot of people, they go off to their church building and um, I'm not going to go off on that issue right now, but the, the point is they'll go and they're told what to believe, but they're not told why they should believe it. Why? Well, because church buildings, um, you're stuck with basically an hour, maybe at the most, Sunday morning that you can preach on different subjects. You cannot instruct the body of Christ in that amount of time. It's mostly a social club. I mean, and I've gone to them all my life, so don't tell me again. You know, I've preached in Baptist, you know, church buildings and, and things for many years, so don't tell me about it, that I'm some kind of anti-church thing or something like this, you know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, you cannot instruct people. And it's very easy to believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, which I don't use the term tribulation. And we'll be getting into that more as we continue in this study. I'm going to show you why I don't use that term, because it's not scriptural. Um, but, you know, it's very easy to believe that the Lord is going to catch away His bride. I mean, it's, it's simple, it's basic understanding. Uh, we are part of the body of Christ. God is not going to put us through a time of judgment with the lost world, which is what the time of Jacob's trouble is. It starts with the uh, um, unleashing of the Antichrist. Couldn't think of the word there. The unleashing of the Antichrist. That's what starts it. Okay, It's judgment from beginning to end. Don't give me this nonsense that, well, it's not really God's judgment until the wrath comes and then we're out of here before that. That is nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. And again, we're going to get into all this stuff. I'm going to show you the scriptures. It's going to be a very detailed study. Um, but what happens is it's very easy for a Christian to understand God's not going to put me as a Christian, a member of the body of Christ. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ says to, to Saul on the road to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Well, you know, Saul didn't persecute Jesus Christ. Well, who's he talking about? Jesus is talking about the body of Christ. All right. Um, when the body of Christ is being persecuted, you are in effect, the lost world is in effect persecuting Jesus Christ. Now, the time of Jacob's trouble begins with the first seal being opened and the Antichrist is unleashed. And he signs the uh, peace treaty there with the Jews and the Arabic nations. And so the temple can be built and all the other stuff. Or, all right, I mean, that's nobody's going to argue that point. It starts with the signing of that covenant. All right, so, but... What's the purpose of all that? Again, we're going to get into that in this study. But it's God's judgment from beginning to end. It's God's wrath from beginning to end. All right? And, of course, you know, you say, well, uh, the word wrath isn't there in the first part and stuff like this. Yes, but you can use, you know, use something called common sense. Uh, when God is judging the world through, a, you know, the Antichrist and, and everything else, that's His wrath. And, of course, somebody takes the mark of the beast, they worship the beast. What do they get? They get the wrath. 
So don't give me this nonsense that the wrath doesn't come till the end of the thing. And again, we're going to cover the scriptures. So at the very outset, I'm not going to go to Ken Hoven personally, privately, at, at the beginning here because he'll just say, did you read the book? I'll say no, you know, whatever else. The first step in me answering this whole thing is I'm going to debunk his book. This book I'm going to be debunking today, every point in it. All right, detailed study coming up. So, if you don't like a lot of meat, this is not the study for you. Uh, there's plenty of milk out there, so go have some of that. But I'm going to start out here, then I'm going to make another video. I'm going to show uh, why the body of Christ has to leave before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. If you are non-dispensational, that's one of the things. Ken Hoven is non-dispensational, and we're going to see that in this study, that we're going to see how you just make a mess of the Bible when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. And I'm going to show you that. But uh, when you rightly divide the word of truth, you will clearly see that there are major contradictions that arise if you are not, if you take any stand but a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. If you believe in any kind of thing where the body of Christ goes into any part of that coming seven-year Daniel 70th week time period, also called uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, if you believe that the body of Christ goes into any part of that, major, major contradictions with the Pauline epistles. And again, we're going to see that today. So, needed to give all that as an introduction. Now, let's get into this thing. Now, I'm going to tell you uh, just another little thing here, another little part of this introduction. I kind of remember and everything. I did not write any notes down for this because, quite frankly, I really don't need notes. I know this subject um, very well. Uh, God will use um, men. He will use preachers uh, to defend certain areas, and other preachers will arise. God will use them for defending other areas of the faith. All right, um, we can't. There's no such thing as a, as a preacher that knows every single subject and, can, and is an expert on every single subject. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, my two biggest subjects have always been defending the King James Bible and the defending the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. All right, People call it the pre-tribulation rapture. It's a false term, but people don't know what you're talking about if you don't use that thing. But these two things are the biggest areas for me. So when somebody starts to say there's no scripture for the rapture and all this other stuff, you know, being before the time of Jacob's trouble, before the Daniel's 70th week, uh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. And we're going to see that. But way, way back, 2008, uh, when I first entered the ministry, uh, I, I started to make videos defending the King James Bible, talking about how I used new versions for the first uh, 25 years of my life and the spiritual wreck that my life was in because of that. And uh, I started to also see a lot of the teachings against the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. And understanding Scripture, understanding what God has planned for the future, um, basically the, the whole issue is going to be that God right now is dealing with uh, both Gen Jews and Gentiles, as the as you know, you get saved, you're a member of the body of Christ. God does not see distinction once you're saved. Um, he sees distinct, distinction among the lost, but once you're saved, there's no distinction anymore. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus, and so right now, God's dealing with both Jews and Gentiles, and Israel as a nation is has basically their their. I don't want to say cast off, but God's not dealing with them nationally right now. Um, he's dealing with us as Christians to provoke the Jews to jealousy. You can read about that in Romans chapter 11. Again, I've done plenty of studies on that. But what's going to happen is the attention, God's attention is starting to shift away from the world and it's starting to go back to Israel again. And now the Jews are starting to come back on the world scene. They have their own nation, just like was prophesied in the book of Matthew chapter 24. 
Um, they they're back there. They're looking at you know building rebuilding the temple. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff going on, and you can see prophecy being shifted over back towards the Middle East again. You have the Pope uh, setting up you know the wanting to make Jerusalem an international city. You know, hello, <laughs> build a temple there, and then the the Pope has a seat in the temple and things. You know, and I don't believe the Pope is the Antichrist. By the way, I believe he's a false, the false prophet. You know, could be actually Francis is the false prophet. I think that's very, very plausible. But uh, whether Francis or the next Pope, one of them is going to be the false prophet. I can pretty much guarantee you on that. And I think Francis is probably the one because he's the first Jesuit Pope. I mean, it just there's a lot of stuff lining up. But all they're waiting for is the New Age Christ to show up. And I think he's going to be a perfect counterfeit for Jesus Christ. Uh, he's going to be you know, the one that the Jews accept. And uh, again, I'm going to say more on that in a little bit. But as we see this transition from what many call the church age, the body of Christ, God dealing with Jews and Gentiles, and they're all one in Christ when you get saved. As we see that transition happening over to this time of Jacob's trouble, there is a gospel that is preached in that time of Jacob's trouble, and I've argued many times with the brethren over this thing, but it is a different gospel than what we have today. It's still faith in Jesus, but there is an element of works involved. Why? Because you have the mark of the beast. Now, you can do a lot of dumb sins right now as a Christian and still go to heaven. All right, I do believe in eternal security, uh, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's not there. The only people who are eternally secure in the time of Jacob's trouble are the 144,000 that are sealed uh, by the Lord in Revelation chapter 7. The average person, if you're saved in that time period, if you're a tribulation saint, okay, or a time of Jacob's trouble saint would be the right way to say it, if you're one of them, you can't take that mark of the beast. And that's a big problem, very, 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 very big problem for those who believe that the body of Christ goes into any part of that time, Daniel's 70th week. What do you do when a Christian takes the mark of the beast? If we're sealed under the day of redemption, according to Ephesians chapter 1, what do you do when a Christian takes the mark? And there's all kinds of pious ways to, get to escape that. You know, well, a real Christian wouldn't take the mark. And yeah, sure, right. Uh, you know, it's a big problem for them. They can't ever answer it. You know, I know. I remember uh, Stephen Anderson came out and he said that uh, the Antichrist is going to have brain scanners, you know, and that they'll scan people. And, oh, wait, you're a Christian, then they'll go to be beheaded. Uh, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. But because there's a different gospel being preached, and we're going to look at that today in this study, we're going to see that it is definitely a different gospel. What happens is when you get a Christian today that starts to deny the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, and they start to say Christians are going to go into Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, or you know, Christians are going to go into it. They'll start to lean towards that gospel that's preached in the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll start to go with it. And what is it? Let's look about it. Here we have, I'm going to adjust my camera thing here. Here we have acknowledgments. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here, make sure you can see this really good. Satan fought against the, uh, me harder in this project than anything I have ever done. I think it is because he knows his lies about end time events will cause many to fall away and exposing the lies and presenting the truth in my simple fourth grade style will help many. Now look at that, endure to the end. Okay, down here he talks about getting additional help from Steve Quayle. That guy's a wing nut. Okay, I don't believe he's saved for a minute. You know, definitely a, a very militantly, you know, he's on the Alex Jones show all the time and everything. I mean, Alex Jones show, Ooh, give me a break. Just crawling with Jesuits and disinfo agents and stuff like that. Alex Jones is a total tool of Satan. I mean, the guy's just filthy. Oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. You know, and then you see him off film and he's using all kinds of profanity. And the guy's just a... And he will fill you with a spirit of fear, you know, just disgusting. A fear of man, too, not a fear of God. But you see it there. Ken Hoven says that Satan, and then he says his lies about end time events. So according to Ken Hoven, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away is a lie of Satan. We're going to see about that. We're going to see what the Bible actually teaches on this issue. Now it goes into a lot of things here about... Um, 
his past and everything, uh, Brother Hoven's past. We're not going to show all that for sake of time. Uh, but uh, here it says, Others, like the end time events, require that we study to show ourselves approved unto God in order to rightly divide the word of truth. And then he goes on to show that you can just skip all over the Bible, take stuff from the Gospels and, and whatever else, and, and just apply it to Christians today. And he outright lies a couple times about the thing of rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, many Christians have not been properly instructed in uh, dispensational matters. And we're going to be talking about that today, why it's so important to rightly divide the word of truth. But he quotes that verse, so he's not ignorant. Brother Hoven is not ignorant of this thing. And over here he says, no scripture can or will contradict any other scripture if properly interpreted. Okay, this is, this is page 10, by the way. No scripture can or will contradict any other scripture if properly interpreted. Okay, well then, if the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, then it should cause no contradictions with the Pauline epistles. And yet there are all kinds of contradictions. You know, all kinds of contradictions. You say, well, you know, like, what are you talking about? Well, let me show you. I'll just show you one, and there's plenty more than this, but uh, we'll just we'll just look at one real quick here. Revelation chapter 13. Very familiar to you if you study this issue. Okay. Verse 16, And he calleth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. goes down into, say, it's 666. No man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. See it there. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. goes down through. Okay? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Any man. Okay? Over here. No man might buy or sell. Any man. You got that? That includes everybody. Right there and right there. No man's going to buy or sell, and any man that takes that mark goes to hell. You got it? Now let's go to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 5. 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verse... Eight, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Wait a second. Back in Revelation, it says that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark and it worships the beast. Revelation 14, verse 9, if any man take the mark, he goes to hell. But this right here says, if any provide not for his own. How are you going to do that? Go to take the mark, you say, hey, I have to provide for my own. If I don't, I've denied the faith. I'm worse than an infidel. You see? Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, that's a contradiction. And we're going to be seeing more of these contradictions that certain parts of Scripture, if you don't rightly divide it and say, wait a second, who's this written to? See? If you don't do that, you try to blend everything all together and make a, you make a mess of Scripture, you know? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, needeth not to be ashamed. When you rightly divide the word of truth and you study, you, are, you need not to be ashamed. So what would the opposite of that be? If you don't study, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, God's ashamed of you. And you make a fool out of yourself and out of what you're teaching. And that's exactly what happens in this book right here. Some of the stuff that, that Ken Hoven writes is just very, very, very bad. And uh, I can tell you right now that uh, Brother Hoven has been deceived by 
a very wicked false prophet. We're going to see who he is here. I'll show him to you. And I'm going to be debunking this guy too. Uh, I'm taking it easy on uh, Dr. Hovind. Where did I put my remote at? There it is. I'm going to take it easy on Dr. Hovind. I, and, you know, let me just say this too. A lot of people don't quite understand me. You know, when I get sarcastic, they think, oh, I'm hateful and whatever else. I'm not hateful. Okay, my sarcasm is just part of my personality. I have a kind of a sarcastic sense of humor. My wife is very much the same way. I don't hate people. Okay, um, when I am sarcastic and I start to uh, put somebody down, it's because I'll do that with a lost person. Uh, save people? No, no, I don't. I don't get really rough on them. Um, uh, Steven Anderson, uh, I don't believe for a minute that he's saved. Uh, he preaches a false gospel. He preaches that Jesus burned in hell uh, to pay for sins. Um, he hates the Jewish people while claiming to want to convert them. You know, uh, it, it, He's got a lot of problems, a lot of very big problems. And uh, ironically, this guy is connected with him. Let me talk about that. But uh, Ken Hoven, I'm going to be a little bit more easy going on Ken Hoven because I do believe that he's a saved man. Here we have page 12. Having a good knowledge of what is happening and what is coming next doesn't take away all the pain, but it takes away the surprise and makes it easier to endure to the end. There you see it again. Here you see, stay faithful to the Lord. Uh, question, real quickly there. Uh, what if you don't? What if a Christian who's sealed until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians chapter 1, let me show you the verse. You might be ignorant of this verse, so I'll just show it to you real quickly here. Ah, going past it. The book of Ephesians. Chapter 1. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. By the way, right there is another, you want a proof text for a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away? We're God's purchased possession. Over in the book of Acts, it talks about God purchasing us with his own blood, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We are his purchased possession. So why on earth would he put us into the time of Jacob's trouble where you can take the mark of the beast and then you're no longer his purchased possession? You're no longer a member of the body of Christ unless God's a liar, unless God shows favoritism towards a Christian that had to take the mark to, to put food on the table. You see the doctrinal problems you get into when you don't rightly divide the word of truth? It's a major, major problem. And I don't blame Ken Hoven for being deceived. You say, who do you blame? Well, I blame this man right here. Let me show you. This man. And there's some serious problems with this guy. I saw an interview with him that he did with uh, uh, Donald Waite, D.A. Waite. Uh, many people know him. He's a defender of the King James Bible, kind of. He defends the uh, Texas Receptus more uh, and, and the King James Bible is a good Bible, but it has some areas where, of course, he'd be smarter to translate it better. Uh, I, have, I have an issue with that. I don't believe you need anything but a King James Bible. I mean, I don't, you know, what are you calling, you know, why would you call this book God's Word when you don't really believe it's perfect, when you believe it could be improved upon? If, if that's so, then you're smarter than God, you know, or just lying, which is the case. But um, I have an issue with that. But I saw... An interview, you can find it online, uh, it's on YouTube, an interview with this Roland Rasmussen and D.A. Waite, and Rasmussen brings up uh, Jack Hiles, he brings up uh, Bob Gray, some of these other guys that I've exposed. I mean, Jack Hiles is, is fornicating, committing adultery with his deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik. I mean, it's just, the guy was a crooked snake. You know, I did a whole video exposing the guy, I mean, four-part series. You know, there were so many problems. And this whole Hiles cult that's come out now, they go out, they speak against repentance, being part of salvation. I mean, they're, they're just, they're easy believism like crazy. I mean, it's, it's a very, very, very bad system. You know, watch my studies on that if you haven't seen that. But, um, so this 
Rasmussen guy to say all about, you know, and, and refer to Jack Hiles. And like, you know, that's a problem. But it says here, if, there, if after you follow and understand my belief on a topic and find you disagree, please feel free to send me your reasons and show me my errors. I assure you that I want to know the truth and teach the truth. It is indeed a scary thing to teach anyone something that is not true. God judges teachers more severely. That's what I'm doing with this study. Okay, I am not trying to to destroy Ken Hovind. I'm not trying to say, uh, you know, hey, Ken Hovind's a wicked satanic heretic Jesuit or something like this. No, 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 no. But guys like this, this Roland Rasmussen guy, guys like him use mind control. They, they'll they use fear. They'll use all kinds of things. They lie like crazy. Um, I'm going to be doing a whole book, or not a whole book, a whole video debunking this guy's book. Um, I'm going to show you another book over here. There are two famous books that teach this ridiculous nonsense of a post-trib pre-wrath rapture. Uh, Rasmussen's book, which is on the way right now. I have it ordered. And this one here, The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church by Marvin Rosenthal. There you can see it on the overhead camera. Okay. I'm going to be showing you some quotes from this too. I already did show a little bit about it, but uh, I might do a more thorough debunking of that thing eventually, but uh, we'll, we'll see. But this guy is the one that led uh, Dr. Hoven astray. Um, and even Ken Hoven said in this book here, he even admits that he came into this one part of the book of Daniel where it talks about 2,300 days and things, and he couldn't figure it out. So he said to his wife, send me Rasmussen's book, and that's when the whole thing happened. So in other words, you didn't get it from the Lord, you got it from some man. He got this teaching. And I can guarantee you, I can assure you, you could read this King James Bible from cover to cover. You can read the Pauline epistles. You can be, read the book of Revelation, Daniel, whatever you want. You can read it 300 times and you will never, ever, ever come to this conclusion or Rasmussen's conclusion on your own. It's never going to happen. Not a chance. The Holy Spirit is not leading him, Marvin Rosenthal, and he's not leading Rasmussen. And I'll, another interesting little fact about this Rasmussen guy is he is the one that does the voiceovers in Steven Anderson's movie After the Tribulation. Again, just do a Google search. Ronald, or, or excuse me, Roland Rasmussen, R-A-S-M-U-S-S-E-N, Dr. Roland Rasmussen, and you will see it come up with uh, Steven Anderson's stuff, and it'll say he's the one that did the voiceover. And yet I remember Sam Gipps said, you know, to Steven Anderson, you got this stuff from Rasmussen. Oh, no, 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 I didn't get it from Rasmussen. Even though Steven Anderson's parents say that they got saved under Rasmussen's ministry. And Anderson grew up and out in that area there. Interesting. But Anderson, you know, he was shown the truth of the post-trib pre-wrath rapture when he was just 12 years old. God showed it to him. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. God is not behind this, this post-trib pre-wrath stuff. It is... It is for it to work, I'm just going to tell you right now, for this system to work, you have to make God a liar. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you in this study. Okay, so let's continue here. Daniel's 70th week, the final seven-year period before the rapture of the believers. Um, let's look about that. It's all about Christians. I mean, you know, I think one of the worst dumbest heresies out there right now is that this whole Bible is for Christians. Uh, people just kind of have this, this uh, you know, mindset that, you know, it's all about us as Christians. Uh, no, actually, we're just a little blip in the time period there of, you know, God's plan from the Old Testament the whole way through to eternity. Okay. Uh... Let's look here. Verse 24 says here, 70 weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in, ev in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the, vi the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, and we can go down through there. You can just read that yourself if you don't have a Bible, but... 
Verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abom abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay? So, what is the purpose of Daniel's 70th week? For the body of Christ? No. No, it's not for the body of Christ. Who is it for? My people. And the holy city. What's the holy city? Jerusalem. Who's my people? Israel. The time, the Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble is for the nation of Israel. That is what's going on. All right? Let me look up a, real, a verse here really quickly. Um... Just, I want to just kind of show you why this is going to happen. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Let's go there. 1 Samuel chapter 8. See, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't understand what you're getting at here. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm having some weird camera difficulties right here. Um... Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. Uh, it says here about the elders of Israel. We'll go to verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And the thing displeased Samuel and when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, um, in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Okay, what is the condition of modern day Israel? Have they accepted their king, Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. They have not accepted God manifest in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. What do they want? I have a whole study on the thing of answering a Jewish rabbi's objections to Jesus Christ. They are looking for a New Age Messiah. And when they describe who this Messiah is, they're describing the Antichrist. It's very ironic. But you see this thing there of back here in the Old Testament, they're saying, we don't want God to rule over us. We don't want God to judge us. We want a man. You see? They reject Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, their true Messiah. They say, I don't want God there. I don't want, you know, Jesus to rule over us. So what's God going to give them? The Antichrist, a false Messiah. God says, oh, you, you don't want me? You don't want to accept Jesus? You're going, to, you're going to get the false Messiah. But ironically, what happens to those Jews that do accept Jesus as their Messiah? That do accept Jesus as their king? to rule over them. They leave before the time of Jacob's trouble, before Daniel's 70th week. And by the way, Daniel's, the, the, the 70 weeks there are determined upon the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So between week 69 and week 70, there's a gap there that we call the church age, where we are at right now. But how do we end that church age and go into the 70th week? It just kind of blends into it no, there's an event that happens. And by the way, let me just say this too. This is why the rapture issue, I, I get so sick and tired of people. Oh, they preach hey, rapture is not a big issue. When the rapture happens, it doesn't matter. I don't care. Well, you're quite ignorant. You see, because when the, the catching away of the, of the bride of Christ happens, it will be the single most significant event ever in the history of the world. Say, well, what are you talking about? Think about something. Wars. Are wars significant? Sure. But you know what? I have no idea what's going on in the battlefields where America's soldiers are over building the empire, you know, for the Vatican. I don't know what's going on over there. I'm not worried about improvised explosive devices or, or, or you know, sniper fire when I go out to check the oil in my car or something. Not at all. I'm not worried about somebody putting a landmine out here on the street or something like this. I don't know. I, I don't care about that stuff. It doesn't affect me. 
Okay, You can have a war in another part of the earth that's really bad and people dying like crazy, but it doesn't affect other people. Okay, what about Jesus Christ? You say, well, Jesus Christ, that'd be, the, you know, his dime, his death on the cross, that'd be the most significant thing. Uh, well, that was the most important spiritual event, but it was not the most significant. Why? There were people in the area there, you know, over in Thessalonica and things like this, and some of the heathen round about the, the areas around Jerusalem, they didn't even know what happened. You know, the Athenians are going, you know, he's setting forth strange gods, you know, and stuff like this. Acts chapter 17. They didn't even know Jesus died on the cross. And yet they're over in that eastern area there. See, Jesus died on the cross. That was the most important spiritual event, but it was not the most significant spiritual event. The most significant, the one that's going to make the most change in the world is going to be when the body of Christ leaves. You talk about a worldwide event that's going to affect everyone. I'm not saying that everybody has a saved member of their family or whatever else. No, but I believe that there are saved people in every country. And when the rapture happens, it's going to be quite significant. Okay? Very, very, very significant. And also believing as I do, and I have a whole uh, pre-trib rapture moment on this. Uh, again, I use the popular term because people don't know what pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away means. They just look at it and go, what? You know. But I do believe that the children under the age of accountability, are going to be leaving along with the body of Christ. Now, if that happens, and I can't be dogmatic, I can't say it's definitely going to happen, I'm saying I believe that that will happen, that children will also be called away before this time of God's judgment and wrath comes. You know, there's been debate back and forth on that thing. But if that happens, can you imagine the trauma that that will cause? Can you imagine that? All right? Now, what's going to happen in the wake of that? Can the Antichrist come to power very easily? Absolutely. Sure. Totally. But uh, what if we're just here? And all of a sudden, this guy shows up and he's bringing peace, you know, and he signs this peace treaty and everything else. Every Bible-believing Christian out there is going to be going, that's the Antichrist. That guy's the Antichrist. We would expose him. You know, right now, I mean, it's just like they, they come out, the Pope does some kind of thing, and all Christian blogs and Christian websites and Christian videos, you know, Tony Palmer comes out and he says, the Lutherans have rejoined Catholicism, the protest is over, you might as well just all be called Catholics now, you know, and there's like tons of videos, I put up a video, a whole bunch of other people put up videos, it just goes, and goes viral online. But what would happen if the body of Christ was gone? Uh, that uh, hindering spirit would be removed as well. The body of Christ leaves. Now nobody's going to stand against the Antichrist. I mean, when the rapture happens, all that's going to be left on earth are lost people. Who's going to stand against the Antichrist? It'd be pretty easy for him to come to power. So the devil, knowing this, and him inspiring people, you know, him knowing that, uh, what's he going to want to tell people? Is he going to want really strong teaching on the time of Jacob's trouble, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away? Or is he going to want people to think, oh, there is nothing like that. Christians just go right into it. We'll be getting more into that later. But you see, the Jews right now are expecting a Messiah, and they're going to get one. And unfortunately, it's going to cause a lot of death among them. But let's look down here. He has tribulation. Okay, he's explaining different things here. Many refer to this entire seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, as the tribulation, but actually only the last half or three and a half years is called the time of great tribulation. Matthew 24, 21, Luke 21, 23, Revelation 2, verse 22. Okay, now look up those three places. Actually, we're, we'll do that since we have a detailed study here. If you want... You know, I get this from all people all the time. He's not providing any scriptures. Okay, I'm providing scriptures now. And then they'll go, it's too long. <laughs> okay, can't win. But it says here, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the time of, of the world to this time, uh, no, nor ever shall be. Okay, now, do you see that as a title? Then shall be great tribulation. It's not a title, it's a description. The term 
great tribulation or tribulation is never one time, never once in the King James Bible is it ever given as a title for the coming time period. The only true two titles of that coming time period are Daniel's 70th week and the time of Jacob's trouble. Never once is it called the tribulation. That's why I, don't, I do not say, I try not to say pre-tribulation rapture. All right, because when people go, well, we're appointed to tribulation, we'll have tribulation in this life. Yes, we will. But the time of Jacob's trouble, no, we aren't going to have that. Why? It's the time of Israel's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. Do you understand that? I certainly hope so. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall uh, fall by the edge. Or did I go past it? Relation 21, verse 23. One of them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Well, it doesn't even say tribulation, so I don't know why you would quote that verse there. Um, to prove the tribulation thing. Revelation 2, verse 22. There's a lot of things I want to say in this study, so I'm sorry if I'm a little bit stumbling over myself right now. It's just there, my mind is very full with things that I need to say. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Again, it is a description. It is not a title. So, the basic premise of this whole thing is very, very false. Uh, you know, the, the we're not a, you know we're going to go through the tribulation. Uh, well, Christians will have tribulation in this life. Yes, that's true, but there's no time period in the Bible called the tribulation. That's not a Bible term. That's a real problem. Okay. It says here, the day of Christ. This day is mentioned seven times in Scripture and alluded to twice more, always with great anticipation of good for the saints. Now, again, we have a major error with, with Brother Hoven, what he's trying to teach. He is trying to say that the day of Christ is, is a mention of the rapture. Okay? No, it's not. This is one of the big mistakes he makes. Two big mistakes. Number one, he tries to say that the tribulation is somehow different than the time of Jacob's trouble. Very, very false. Extremely false. Okay? Very bad premise to start with. Number two, he says that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two different things. No, they're not. No, they're not. And I'm going to show it to you right now. The day of Christ is always with great anticipation of good for the saints. Really. I'm going to show you that that doesn't work. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now Ken Hoven will quote this thing over and over and over again, but the point is, he'll say, over here he says, Always with great anticipation of good for the saints. Not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Uh, that doesn't sound like it's a good anticipation for the saints. But why would they be shaken in mind and troubled if the day of Christ is a good thing? It's not. It's the day of the Lord. And what Paul is saying here in this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's, you know, they're getting worried and they're going, wait a second. The last letter you sent to us, what we have today is uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. You're telling us that the Lord's going to catch us away before this thing happens. We're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. All right? And it's very clearly before that day of the Lord. And, and again, I've proved this in study after study after study. And I'm going to continue to prove it in this study. But they're like, wait a second. We're being told, people are sending us these letters saying, the day of Christ is at hand, the day of the Lord there. You know, and you say, well, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is separate. Uh, isn't Christ the Lord? Yes. And the day of Christ, 
yes, it starts out with, with the Lord coming back and there's judgment and things there, but then it starts that six th that uh, thousand year millennial kingdom, all right? And we're going to see later on that there's another big boo-boo that, that uh, this Rasmussen guy makes and Ken Hoven follows him and really makes a problem with the Bible, okay? The day of the Lord happens. It starts with the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to judge the nations. Well, first the battle of Armageddon judges the nations and he separates the sheep from the goats and they go into the kingdom. He restores the earth and everything is very, very good there. And we're going to see about that here as we continue. But to say that it's always with great anticipation of good for the saints, well then somebody's writing and saying, hey, the day of Christ, the rapture, so to speak, is at hand. They'd be happy. They wouldn't be distressed. So again, we have proof from one of the key scriptures that Ken Hoven uses over and over again. We have proof that the day of Christ is a time of uh, fear there. Okay? It's the day of the Lord. It's just another reference to the day of the Lord. It is not a reference to the rapture. That's not true. Here we have the next page, page 14. He has rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Matthew 24, 31. Mark 13, verse 27. These have nothing to do with the rapture. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. This passage here is the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. This has nothing to do, there is no body of Christ in the entire book of Matthew 24, or in the entire chapter, excuse me, in Mark 13. We're going to see about that as we continue. I've talked about this before. And very ironically, this whole book, this whole thing, Ken Hoven never once brings up 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. So why is that? Let me show you. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul talking about the resurrection. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay? That's one reference to the word trump. Now let's look at the other reference. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Again, I've talked about this in many studies. Only two references to this word trump. Trump is the sound that the trumpet makes. It is not the trumpet itself. It's the sound that a trumpet makes. You say, what's the significance of that? Revelation chapter 4. John writing to all the different churches. And here in chapter 4 we have, After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. A trump, in other words. A trumpet doesn't talk. Okay? But when you have a trump, it's the voice of a trumpet. So he hears a voice that sounds like a trumpet. And look what happens. Which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat at the throne. Or one sat on the throne, excuse me. Immediately. Immediately. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And who blows the trump? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The trump of God. You say, I'm still not convinced. You're not proving anything. Really? Let's go to the book of John, chapter 10. Okay. Jesus speaking here. You can read this part. He's speaking to them as kind of a, a parable. There you can see this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Why? Well, he's not talking to them about the second coming. He's talking to them about something else. And look at this. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. What's a Christian do? 
we go up, we're called up to the clouds, we go to the judgment seat of Christ, marriage supper lamb, we come back down, and what do we find? Pasture, the millennial kingdom. Interesting. But wh what's it say there? I am the door. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. I am the door. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. That's, by the way, what all the post-tribber people do. They steal, um, they steal God's promises to the Jews. They kill your joy. And they destroy your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be looking at that as we continue. But um, da, 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 the hireling flees because of the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. Okay, sorry, that's what I was looking for. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One fold. Jews and Gentiles. God makes no distinction according to the book of Galatians. You see it? Ironic that uh, the uh, tribulation, you know, the post-trib rapture stuff, you know, the, the passages, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Why isn't there any kind of an account like that in the book of John? Why is it that John experiences being called up before the Antichrist is unleashed? He sees a door in heaven, hears his name, a voice that sounds like a trumpet. Kind of strange, isn't it? There are no clear scriptures approve a pre-tribulation rapture. Well, the, you know, there are no clear scriptures that teach that, but the, a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away? Oh, there's plenty of scriptures on that. I reject the tribulation title. It's not a title, it's a description. Again. But, uh, here we go. Typical stuff. And if you saw my video, it's I said I know how he's going to do it. It's going to be non-dispensational. He's going to go to the Gospels to try and disprove the rapture, pre time of Jacob's trouble catching away. And he's going to talk about 1830. Here we go. Pre-trib rapture, the idea taught since 1830. Okay? Absolutely not true. I talked about that in other studies. But here we go. Post-trib. This has been the historic position of the church. I have a little question mark here. Who's the church? For 2,000 years, and it is the majority opinion among believers worldwide today. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. And by the way, earlier, Ken Hoven was talking about the majority is always wrong. I can guarantee you the majority of Bible-believing Christians do not believe in a pre-wrath, post-trib nonsense. Okay? That is not true. But you've seen this thing, you'll see this all over this post trib pre wrath stuff. They'll say, you know, this is the historic position. This is the store this is the position that the early church believed in and everything else. This is this is the historic position. Oh really? Why don't we look at uh, Marvin Rosenthal, one of the two greatest proponents of this, you know, pre wrath rapture of the church thing. Rosenthal and Rasmussen are the two men that started this whole thing. Okay, let me show you what he has to say about this. The historic position of the church. Look at this. Chapter 19, page 265. The pre-wrath rapture. Why this view now? Wait a second. I thought this was the historic position of the church. And, and you know, let me just say this before we continue. Watch out for this thing of the historic position of the church. All right. Oh, that's very dangerous. You see, the true church, those true Christians that, that have survived, you know, that, that went down through the centuries, that were being persecuted and hunted down by Roman Catholicism, uh, they didn't exactly have a huge libraries and volumes of stuff that they were writing down. I mean, the, the printing press wasn't created until, you know, in Gutenberg in the 16th, early 16th century. 
Christians weren't exactly walking around carrying, you know, writing books and books and books and making DVDs back there, you know, obviously DVDs, but they weren't exactly making a lot of books. And if they were, they got burned when those Christians were caught and tortured by the Roman Catholics. So to say it's the historic position of the church, very, very dangerous. Okay, what they usually, what people are usually referring to is, they're usually referring to uh, these church fathers. And those guys were so heretical, this baptismal regeneration and, and all kinds of weird philosophies and stuff. Um, men like uh, Polycarp and, and uh, Athanasius and, and uh, what's the guy from Alexandria, Egypt? Uh, Origen, Adamantius Origen. I mean, all these guys, heretics, complete heretics. And so people say, well, you know, they'll look at some of their writings and if they see that, oh, well, we have to have a time of purification, the church has a final time of purification, they say, see, it's a historic position of the church. Uh, those guys aren't part of the church that I'm part of, all right, those early church fathers. I reject them. And by the way, I have a, a preacher rapture moment on the thing of what did the Catholic Church teach down through the centuries. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the one that kills Christians still today, the one that's going to be doing it in the future, that church, you know, um, they have always taught the church would go through this time of Jacob's trouble. They're the ones that teach it. So you get all this stuff. All the Jesuits came up with the pre-trib rapture and all this other stuff. Nonsense. Nonsense. Okay, the Jesuits' purpose is to draw people back under the control of the Roman Catholic system. So why would they give a theory that's a, a, a scriptural you know, theory that's completely contrary to Roman Catholic doctrine? Okay, Roman Catholicism teaches this thing of Jesus' blood is not enough. You need to be purified. Okay, the church has been bad and we need to be purified and things. That's what this whole system is. It's not about the Jews. It's not about God dealing with the nation of Israel again with signs and wonders to confirm the book of Revelation. Oh no, no, it's about us. It's about the church. We're so weak here in America. And we're going to have to have our faith tested. And it's going to be good. You're going to get to die as a martyr by having your head cut off. and It's wonderful. We're going to be tortured and we're going to suffer for Christ. And you better get ready because you're going to have to endure to the end. And the uh, you know, give me a break. But look what Marvin Rosenthal says. All right, Ken Hoven just got done saying that this is the historic position of the church. Look what Marvin Rosenthal says. One of the two biggest proponents of the post-trib pre-wrath rapture system. Look what he says. Perhaps at this point an important question must be answered. If the thesis of this book is correct, if the church is to be raptured pre-wrath at the opening of the seventh seal and therefore sometime within the second half of the 70th week of Daniel, why has this position never been enunciated before? Why only after more than 1900 years into the church age does this view appear on the scene? Is it simply a new and fanciful position set forth by an extremist? This is a legitimate issue deserving a satisfactory response. Marvin Rosenthal telling you that the pre-wrath, post-trib rapture is a modern invention. And of course he goes on to say none of the other positions have ancient historiosity either. Uh, so, you know, nothing really can claim the, the thing there. But I believe because of Scripture that this is the true belief and things. He goes on to talk about that. But the fact of the matter is, at least he's honest enough to say, yeah, this thing's, you know, 1900 years of church history. So if you want to say that the pre-trib rapture came from 1830, by Marvin Rosenthal's own admission, this system is even newer. So it's a rather stupid argument to come out and say, the rapture, there was no mention of a pre-trib rapture before 1830. And there was, by the way. Again, I've proved that in other videos. But to, to make that statement, that's a dumb position to take. 